Thanks again for joining us for today's ANA National Webinar, Champions of Native Language. Um, today is November 6, 2014. So this session is being presented by the Pacific Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. Uh, we are a resource of the Administration for Native Americans, and we're located out here in Hawaii on the island of Oahu. Um, and you can learn more about our regional TTA center at our website, www.anapacificbasin.org. Um, so a little bit about ANA. Uh, the Administration for Native Americans promotes self-sufficiency for Native Americans by providing discretionary grant funding for community-based projects and training and technical assistance to eligible tribes and Native organizations. Um, and ANA's vision is that all Native communities are thriving. And so until that vision is accomplished fully, they will be working steadfast to make that happen. And uh, you can learn more about ANA on their website, uh, which is listed there on the screen, www.acf.hhs.gov slash programs slash ANA. And um, you can also just Google Administration for Native Americans and you'll be able to find them as well. All right, and so uh, we have a couple of upcoming ANA webinars that you might be interested in. Um, basically, every Thursday, uh, we have some type of webinar. And um, the hosting duties cycle between our four regional offices, our Alaska Regional TTA Center, our Eastern Regional TTA Center, our Western Center, and the Pacific TTA Center. And so um, on November 13th, the Alaska region is going to be hosting a session on the Alaska Native Settlement Claims Act. Um, November 20th, oh, right, 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 sorry. Um, yes, next, week, next week's webinar is Wednesday, November 12th. Thank you for that clarification, Michelle. Um, on November 20th, there's going to be uh, an overview of Public Law 477, which you might be interested in um, Indian Advancement Act. And December 4th, um, we in the Pacific are going to be hosting a session on the governmental statuses of Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, which is a little different than the tribal structure um, in the continental US. And you can find all of the ANA webinars and register for them on the events page of the ANA website. All right, so for today's session, um, we just have two goals. Um, the first is to highlight three champions of native language education and just give them the space to tell their own stories of success and um, about a little about their careers in um, education, but mostly about the kind of projects and work that they're doing now. Um, and then our secondary goal is to alert you to ANA funding opportunities that support native language programs such as these. <clears throat> All right, so ANA, the Administration for Native Americans, um, actually has a funding area specifically focused on native language projects. Um, and these are all housed under CFDA number 93.587. Um, and so you can um, you can apply for these in our these grants in our upcoming grant cycle, which will be taking place in the first um, quarter of next year, about around that time. Um, so our two grants are the um, Native American Language Preservation and Maintenance Grant, um, and then our um, Esther Martinez Immersion Grant. And uh, the Preservation and Maintenance Grant uh, it funds any type of language project that's primarily focused on teaching, using, revitalizing your um, native language. And the Esther Martinez Immersion Grant um, is focused specifically on projects that use an immersion style approach to education. Um, and you can learn more about the details of these funding areas 
on the ANA website. So go to the ANA website and um, visit the funding opportunities page and you'll find more there. And after this webinar, we'll be sending out an email to everyone who registered um, with links to these resources, as well as a few other resources, language related resources you might find useful. Um, so for today's session, we are lucky to be able to feature uh, three pioneers of native language. And each of these educators represents um, a different stage, I think, of, um, of careers in, in language education. Um, so we're going to be starting with uh, Dorothy Lazor, who's really a pioneer of um, language immersion, especially in um, building curricula, um, who's been teaching for 42 years and has really laid a lot of the foundation for other language um, projects. Um, we'll be featuring her first. And then we'll be going to Ke Haulani Shintani from Ahapunanaleo in Hawaii, which is a uh, Hawaiian language immersion preschool program with more than 11 preschools um, throughout the state. And uh, that's very successful here. Um, and then last, we'll be featuring a new project that's been gaining a lot of momentum um, here in Hawaii that focuses on Samoan language immersion um, in a community center type of format called the Fetuao Samoan Language Center. And that will be presented by Elisabetta Alaimaleata and John Mayer. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Ms. Dorothy Lazor. Uh, Ms. Dorothy Lazor was brought up in Akwesasne in Mohawk country. Uh, for 42 years, Ms. Lazor has been a trailblazing pioneer in the field of native language immersion helping tribes and Pacific Island peoples even to establish their own native language curricula. Um, and she currently lives in Ontario, Canada, but Ms. Lazor has also worked on an ANA grant on the American side of the Mohawk Reserve to teach Mohawk language to adults in an immersion setting. Um, so today she works for the Akwesasne Cultural Reservation Program and we are certainly honored to be able to feature Ms. Lazor at the top of today's webinar. So Ms. Lazor, without further ado, um, the stage is all yours. Please take it away. Sorry, we seem to be having a slight technical difficulty. I think, um, Dorothy, you might just have to unmute your your microphone. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So do I start over? Seco, Sewaguego Olote Galihua Hawaiung Yaksne Ugwehue Neha. Hello, everyone. My Mohawk name is Olote Galihua Hawe. Dorothy Ann Lazor, Yung Yaksne Gyohansa. My English name is Dorothy Ann Lazor. Wagine Yotlonu, I am of the Deer Clan. Akuzaslonu, Nigat Doda, I am a person of Akuzasne. Akuzasne Disnai Nenue, Niwaga de Hialu. I was raised in Snai. Yayak, Jinigun hes, Kayeri, Diwasa, Niosalage, Nigariwes, Wakiri Hunya. I taught for 42 years. The Mohawk people are located in Upper New York State and within two Canadian provinces of Ontario and Quebec. An estimated population of Mohawk people is 30,000. Within, es within this estimated population, we have at least about 1,500 speakers remaining. Within each of these communities, Mohawk people are relearning the language through early childhood programs, immersion programs, uh, immersion programs with the existing school systems, adult immersion classes, 
adult classes provided by our councils and our tribe on the American side of our community. I completed my high school at St. Raffles High School in Ontario, and I completed a university degree in Montreal and Chicoutimi in Quebec. I completed a degree in education and linguistic certificate through the University of Chicoutimi. I also established an uh, immersion program across Canada in Mohawk country, and I set up a Mohawk immersion in Ganawage for young elementary students and adults. In Brantford, I assisted the parents to start their immersion program at the nursery level. In Maliseet country, I set up an immersion program at the kindergarten and grade one level, then taught the teachers how to teach an immersion program in their language to students who are not speakers of their language. In Blackfoot country, I set up the program and trained the teachers to teach in an immersion setting from nursery to grade five. In Shushwap country, I set up a teacher training program for the University of Victoria. I also in Hawaii. I worked with a team of professors and parents to set up a Hawaiian immersion at the um, grade one level grade two, and then to grade three. And the program continued right up to, I think now it's at a PhD level. Uh, I worked in Tainanega for 20 years, setting up language programs throughout the elementary and high school programs. For three years, worked on the American side of our reserve to teach adults in an immersion setting to learn the Mohawk language through an ANA grant. Uh, last year, I worked for Mohawk Council, training the staff in the Mohawk language. This year, I am working for the Akwazasna Cultural Restoration Program, um, trying to restore our cultural values, such as um, basket making, hunting, uh, fishing, uh, waterways. Uh, most of this was uh, sort of like destroyed or lost, and we're trying to revive it. But in doing this program, we're including the Mohawk language in every aspect of that program. Uh, how did all this begin? How did I get involved in this type of work? A community of people on the Ganawage Reserve located near Montreal felt they wanted to learn the Mohawk language. The desire was to speak Mohawk. One teacher at the nursery level introduced the idea of teaching all the subject matter to little ones, age four, in, in the Mohawk language. She presented this idea to the parents. The parents agreed. The following year, she traveled with these students to kindergarten. The parents did like the program, and they supported it. The following year, the students went to grade one. Out of 30, they selected 15. They needed a certified Mohawk speaking language teacher. At that time, I was teaching at the grade six level. I was asked by administration to teach the grade one program in Mohawk in an immersion setting. I accepted it. At the time, I knew there were no materials. My only training in methodology was in English. From then, we created, we wrote, and we developed curriculum curriculum materials and teaching materials, and we also designed methods to teach the Mohawk language to students or little ones who were not speakers of their own native tongue. The program entailed teaching the Mohawk language regularly every day and to make sure that they understood and knew what they were saying in the Mohawk language. This is when I felt the fun began, the challenge began. From then on, I was asked to present the program to other surrounding communities within our area. Now, within each of these communities, the program development focused on curriculum development, developing materials, which was unavailable in almost every language right across Canada, 
and also to design methods to teach the language so that the students can understand, speak, read, and write in their own language and yet understand what they were doing. I'm presently teaching in a cultural restoration program with eight master teachers, 16 apprentices, who are relearning the Mohawk language by reviving the cultural practices such as basket making, fishing, hunting, horticulture, uh, waterways. And through all these activities, we filter in the language so that the students are able to speak it. This year, we focused a lot on speaking. So all our methods changed to teaching oral language fluently to the students. Next year, we're hoping to move into reading and in the following year into writing. So by the end of four years, the students will be fluent in, in Mohawk and listening to Mohawk speak in it, reading and writing. We're also including all our legends. We have about 150 legends that we have rewritten and we'll be able to teach these to our students so that they can relate it to their little ones or to their family and that they would be able to pass this langu our language down to the younger generations. Yawankoa. All right, thank you, Dorothy. Um, let's see, there's a couple more photos um, from her presentation. All right, so thank you very much. And at, at the end of the um, session, we'll have some opportunities to ask um, some questions. Uh, okay. Did, I okay. Did I stay within my 10 minutes? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so next we'll be featuring uh, Ms. Ke Haolani Shintani from Ahapunanaleo, um, the Hawaiian language immersion preschools in Hawaii. Uh, Ms. Ke Haolani Shintani has been a steadfast pillar of the Hawaiian language movement since 1989. Um, beginning as a volunteer in the Curriculum Development Office, Hale Kuomo'o at Hakaula o Ke'elikolani College of Hawaiian Language at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, today, Ms. Shintani is the administrator of HR for Ahapunana Leo. Um, currently, Ms. Shintani is responsible for coordinating teacher development through in service trainings. Um, and she and her husband care for their nieces who currently attend Kekula o Navahi Hawaiian Language Public Charter School, where Ms. Shintani is a member of the governing board, and we are lucky to have Ms. Shintani here to talk more about Ahapuna Naleo and the projects that she's working on now. So thank you, Kehal, for joining us. Mahalo Luya, Matt. Aloha mai kako. Vau Kehal Lani Shintani. Heli mahana hua iyo ka Ahapuna Naleo. Wahana ia vau ahana ia vau mahana mamaui a ki manawa noho vau mahilo. Ahana vau no ka Ahapuna Naleo. Aloha, my name is Keholani Shintani. I was born and raised on the island of Maui. Um, and I live on the island of Hawaii and I work for the Ahapunana Leo as the professional development coordinator. I'd like to um, just thank Ms. Lazor for her help when we first started our program over um, 30 years ago. Though I didn't meet you, I feel like I have because um, when we talk about the start of our program, your name is always mentioned. And um, I'm quite proud to be able to be presenting right after you. <laughs> your hard work has paid off. Um, over 30 years ago, a group of educa educators got together to discuss the state of the Hawaiian language in Hawaii. There were less than 50 native speakers that were below the age of 18. These members of this, the members of this group returned to their communities and from this was born the Punana Leo. Their vision was and still remains, Eola Ko'olelo Hawaii, the Hawaiian language shall live. Punana Leo is a family-based program pro which provide early childhood education for preschoolers. 
We are a part of a P20 consortium with Navahi Okaleni Opu'u, a Hawaiian medium education K-12 program, as well as Kahaka'ula Oke'eliko Lani, the Hawaiian language college here in Hilo. We are all committed to providing a seamless Hawaiian medium education for our children. Today, we have about um, 10,000 speakers at various levels of Hawaiian um, proficiency. You can look on this slide and it just has um, our, our mission and our vision statement. I'd like to read the second, um, the last paragraph. The Punana Leo initiates, provides for, and nurtures various Hawaiian language environments. Our families are the living essence of these environments, and we find our strength in our spirituality, love of our language, love of our people, love of our land, and love of knowledge. This um, philosophy permeates throughout our entire program, and our families are an essential component to the success of Punanaleo from its start till today. Our teacher development project that we just completed with ANA funds um, were to enhance and strengthen the quality and impact of Punana Leon language nests in the Native Hawaiian community by increasing language fluencies and professional capabilities of all 53 instructional staff. And these are staff members located on five different islands um, here in the state of Hawaii. Through this grant and a partnership with Kahakaula Oke'elikolani, we were able to develop six early childhood courses taught through the medium of Hawaiian through the Hawaiian perspective, as well as offer Hawaiian language courses um, using tele video teleconferencing. I would like to just, um, I would like to say it was a very ambitious goal to have all 53 of our staff members successfully complete all of our language courses as well as all six um, early childhood courses. Our early childhood courses um, were developed through the Hawaiian perspective and was taught through Hawaiian and therefore the course offering was at a 300 level, which is not an introductory course. The students who participated in the ECE course needed to have um, a basic understanding, be able to read and write in Hawaiian. And that took some time to develop. However, we did it. I'm quite proud to say we did it. Um, our courses, our language courses were offered during nap time. I'm sorry, I changed. Let me go backwards. Our language course was offered during nap time while the children were sleeping through a tele, um, video conferencing. And um, our ECE courses were intense teleconferencing for about four to six hours one day a month. And then we would have weekly assignments we needed to complete on Moodle. Um, and also, every semester, we had one overnight face-to-face, -face, eight hours of discussion, presentation, um, covering the information face-to-face. -face. And that's how our coursework were, were delivered. The original intent was for, um, for our teaching staff to participate in these courses. However, we found that because they were newly created and we were getting new knowledge being disseminated to our staff, we opened it up to all of our administrative staff as well so that we could be learning along with our teaching staff. Um, some of our challenges, these were pretty much our big challenges. We had technological um, challenges. We set up a video conferencing type of program and we didn't think to include the computers that our staff would use to access the teleconferencing 
as well as completing the homework. But we were able to get um, Office of Hawaiian Affairs did come in as a non-federal share and help to partner to provide this project. Um, we also had enrollment and registration challenges. The process, even though I thought it was a basic process, I realized that it actually um, we found a lot of incomplete applications. There were medical documents that needed to be submitted, and um, we actually needed to walk each staff member that was did it wasn't fully f aware of the process through the process. Also, we had. Um, employees who were registered at another university that could not register at UH Hilo. Um, there were financial holds that our staff needed to pay off, and there were ac academic bankruptcies. That means um, they attended college, they flunked out of college. So through this program, we actually worked with our staff to pay off their financial holds. We actually worked with our staff to be able to re-enroll in college, so that's um, a great accomplishment for us. And then the basic skill to complete a 300 level course through the medium of Hawaiian, presenting their information, their speeches in Hawaiian, writing in Hawaiian, and then reading in English and being able to discuss the content through Hawaiian were challenges. By the end of the third course, we saw an increase in um, proficiency and understanding, and it became much easier. But in the beginning, it was very difficult. Our biggest challenge was work-life balance. A lot of our staff members were full-time um, full workers. They are young family parents, um, and now they were attending college and going home and completing their homework assignments. Um, but we worked through that as well. And then what we found is for some, a lack of motivation and the understanding of the importance of this program. And one of our biggest challenge was um, in the early childhood field, there is a about a 23% turnover. Well, we were we were seeing that in um, our field. So we would someone would come in, complete maybe two years, and they would leave us to go and work somewhere else. By the end of the project, we realized that. Employee turnover may be a weakness, but we realize that it's actually a strength that Punana Leo has. Um, we've been doing since day one. We help train staff, and they continue on in other Hawaiian language fields. Um, and so we looked at that as a potential um, grant opportunity moving forward. Our accomplishments, we now have um, a piloted series of university early childhood courses taught through the medium of Hawaiian language through the Hawaiian perspective. We definitely have an increased Hawaiian language pr proficiency, oral, written, as well as reading. So we, um, we like that. Um, we also realize that there has been an increased skill in using technology as a means of communicating and completing our work. So our staff is very comfortable, not comfortable now um, participating in um, video conferencing, um, using Moodle, creating PowerPoints, using MS Word, uploading documents, downloading documents. Um, as a, an, an accomplishment of this project is because we've had more staff that is prepared to lead classrooms. This year, we opened up two additional classroom spaces. And we've also identified teachers who have excelled and are able to mentor other teachers. Um, come fall 2015, we will be offering the second round of classes as a regular regularly offered offered course at Kahaka Ulo Ke'eli Kolani. What we did find um, as a result of this project is though our oral proficiency increased, the grammar as well as the mechanics of the Hawaiian language, we are now, um, we wrote another grant um, working with our staff where we need to also um, the new project is to increase the cultural understanding of the language, as well as using cultural context 
to deliver our content in our classrooms. And we're doing that through looking at our Hawaiian language um, literature. And that is a project we're working on for the next three years. Mahalo nui loa no va. Thank you very much for this time. Aloha. Hey, mahalo nui ke hau. Um, thank you very much for sharing the um, progress of your project and a little bit about the history of Punana Leo in Hawaii. Um, next, we'll be featuring Elisapeta um, to Upo Alai Maleata. And um, Elisapeta grew up in American Samoa, the oldest of five siblings, where she taught elementary school for 10 years. Um, in 1998, like many American Samoans, she moved with her family to Hawaii. Um, in 2014, she graduated from the University of Hawaii at Manoa with her, uh, in 2004, she graduated from the University of Hawaii at Manoa with her master's in education and is currently working towards her doctoral degree in second language education. Um, in 2013, she received a grant from ANA to launch the Lefetuao Samoan Language Center a first-of-its-kind Samoan Immersion Community Center for American Samoan youths living in Hawaii. And they're a great example of a young project that has been making a huge impact by um, rolling out the right way. And we are really happy to have Ms. Alai Maliata here to share the successes that her project has seen over the past couple of years. Um, we also have Dr. John Mayer, who's been really instrumental in uh, rolling out this project. Um, unfortunately, his microphone is not working at the moment, but he is on the line to um, to uh, chime in as needed. And so at this, at this time, I'll hand it off to Elisa Petta. Please, Petta, take it away. Hello and warm greetings from Lefetua Samoan Language Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. Uh, we're located on the island of Oahu. Um, we've been in existence since 2008. So this year marks our seventh year. 2013, um, we received a three-year funding uh, for language preservation and maintenance from ANA. Um, before, it was all volunteer work from 2008 to 2000, in the beginning of 2013. So we were, were very grateful and um, blessed to know that um, our other brothers and sisters that came be before us provided the knowledge and understanding about the importance of preserving language. Um, we work side by side with Professor Fipule Ailase, Dr. John Mayer at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. He's the Samoan linguist and many of our community members. Um, the Lefetua Samoa Language Center is committed to building strong families by serving to bridge the culture generational gap between Samoan parents and youth and the broader society, society in which they live. Our mission resonates our commitment to language preservation and maintenance. Our vision, we empower from within the process of inner self-empowerment starts from us, the natives who are the core existence of the mother language and the culture. Our vision is to empower our youth to be productive and contributing citizens with a strong self-image and knowledge of, the, of their Samoan heritage. Currently, we have five language classes. We, we serve preschool to adult level. Um, thanks to Anna for providing us the opportunity to um, develop and, and you know, grow. Um, this year, fall of 2014, uh, we've enrolled 78 participants, not including our adult class. Um, the wait list right now, we do have a wait list of 43. The last time I checked was last week, and that list kept growing. So we all serve students from all over the state here in Hawaii, and we are the only existing um, Samoan um, language um, school that is a community-based um, um, program that is providing this service. Um, our language teachers, our community members, 
we have um, language teachers who are the main instructors of language, our teacher assistants, and we also have community volunteers, college interns, and parent volunteers. Teacher training is one of the most important aspects of L'Efetual, and uh, we start training our teachers from administrative training, um, provide them um, work ethics and um, things that, they, that will support their work. Uh, besides that, we offer Samoan language um, teacher training through the support from the University of Hawaii uh, with Dr. John Mayer. Uh, we provide teaching strategies. We teach them how to be language advocates. So we also incorporate um, ways so that they are trained to become trainers. So we do have five teacher trainings per semester. We identify local resources available. And we've also um, recently uh, became part of HALT, which is in the Hawaii Association of Language Teachers. We've established a new uh, Omasamo site, and that is in Waianae, the west side of Oahu. Um, it's called Fisila Fai. Fisila Fai is under the directorship of Reverend Pesi and Famatala Vitale of the First Samoan Methodist Church in Waianae. Fisila Fai in Samoan means to meet, to receive a special person. Someone that's important and the philosophy behind these community-based developments is empowering our younger generation through their, their, their heritage so they understand their identity, identity through their language and their culture. So we speak to the heart of the children. An incorporation of technology, another aspect that we've added this year to help train our teachers to help you know, develop apps and these are methods to enhance the learning the language, um, link to language lessons, enhances speaking, reading, and writing. Um, we, we have tech tools. We try to develop tech tools to assess teaching and learning um, that helps to boost the interest to learn the language. So the language is accessed through, um, easily through phones or iPads and so forth. Um, I think I went over. OK, we have the Arts Performance Incorporation as well. We learned the language through um, reviving of our old songs and, um, and music. Um, the Art of Tattooing, another uh, important um, aspect of the culture. Um, the language goes together with the culture. So we try to incorporate all of these wonderful activities to help our children. Um, at times when we, um, we break the walls of the classroom and we take them out on field trips where they get to learn and experience um, the Samoan life. And, you know, cooking is, you know, um, is a social event to bring the family, the fr you know, friends together. Intergenerational activities is um, an aspect of the program that is very important where um, our, our participants are able to um, talk story with our elders, where the heritage is documented through technology. So, and it helps enhance respectful relationships in which our culture, we call it Ba It brings wealth to the implementation. Okay. We have an open invitation to invite community scholars and, and people to our implementation, as you can see there. Um, one of the most, um, uh, you know, well-known, well-known person that been documenting a lot of the history of Samoa, um, um, Steve Percival. He was able to share some of his projects with us. Moving along, since um, Dr. Mayer is not able to connect, um, he wanted to share about um, the education and language learning and. Um, our mission and vision is significant. Therefore, um, like the name, it means bright star. Our philosophy stems from an outreach perspective, a community-based approach, which the rays of the morning star must reach all cornerstones of the child development. Therefore, we look at education and language learning as an important aspect of this implementation. The urban communities here in, in Hawaii we look at churches. There's about 70 plus um, Samoan churches here on island. 
and we um, we want to connect with them because that is where the language is. And someone is, someone is an oral language, and being that it was an oral language, knowledge was transferred from one generation to another within families and communities. So it's so there's so much wealth within our church communities here on Oahu. The role of the church in, the, in Samoa and Hawaii uh, provides spiritual more teaching, education, and literacy, reinforces social and family structure, facilitates traditional cultural practices, and it's a venue for Samoan language use. Um, it provides a social interaction for youth where we find fluent Samoan speakers to teach the language. So it's a surrogate village in Samoan communities abroad. We use a lot of successful practices, um, traditional routines, cooperative learning activities, contextualizing learning activities, hands-on experiential learning activities, and so forth. So the, the grant uh, enabled us to develop a curriculum. So at this time, we're currently putting it all together, and we have a draft document. Something that we never had before. So, um, through this program, we're able to develop resources and a curriculum to help uh, future teachers of Samoan language. We only have the ANA funding by the Administration for Native Americans, and we thank you for this great opportunity to help our Samoan community. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, um, and so the, her contact info is on screen, but I'll also have all of the contact info for today's presenters at the end of the webinar. Um, and I'll leave that on screen for you to check out. Um, <clears throat> and so um, right now, we're going to head into the question and answer portion of our session. Uh, we'll keep this open for about 10 or 15 minutes, maybe. Um, so, yes, we, today, just to recap, we first talked to um, Dorothy Lazor, who's really a pioneer in language immersion education and, and pioneering immersion curricula. Um, she also helped to establish the curricula for Ahapuna Naleo, the Hawaiian language um, immersion preschool program in Hawaii that has since grown to be um, have 11 locations on five islands and has been doing a lot of great work. And um, we also just talked to Elisa Petta from Lefetuao Samoan Language Center about her new project and all the things that she's done so far. And so if you have any questions at this point, just type them into the chat box and I'll ask them to our um, presenters in the order they were received. And uh, if you want to directed at any particular presenter, um, please just indicate their name and your question, and I'll start with them. Um, and so we have one, uh, we have a couple of questions that have come in so far. Um, so first question comes from Hartwell Francis. Um, is there any work on language neutral material that can be shared across programs? And I'm assuming this this has to do with like um, educational materials that maybe aren't super specific to one language that could be used for other languages. And feel free to clarify your question if, if um, you want to. And so I guess I'll, um, I'll start, I'll, I'll direct this question to Dorothy, and then um, the other two presenters can chime in afterwards if you'd like. So Dorothy, the question is, are there any, uh, is there any work on language neutral material that can be shared across programs? Cards, Hi. pictures, Hi. picture sets, stuff like that. Uh, yes, there is. We just have to try to make it more available. I think what happened, um, to a certain extent, we went more towards um, reading and writing materials. But right now, a lot of people are going into um, developing pictures, uh, pictures in different activities, uh, pictures within different cultural activities. So that type of information could be shared, but I know it's being worked on. Thank you. 
Thank you. And um, yeah, John Mayer from um, the Fit to Well also chimed in um, with an answer and said, the Fit to Well Someone language curriculum for preschool, teens, and adults was produced in one year of the grant and will be available for free to other community organizations and churches. And so, um, yeah, their contact info will be will be available at the end, and you might want to um, ask them if you think some of the stuff that you saw could be applicable to a project that you're working on in your community. Um, so let me get to the next question. And uh, oh, actually, okay, how do you want to add anything to to that um, answer? Um, no, thank you. Okay, so let's get to the next question. Uh, what are the main methods of teaching used in your in your respective facilities? And for this one, um, I think I'll start with Kehau, and then uh, we can go to maybe Elisabetta after that. Uh, the main method we have is what we call, um, what you would probably call Hawaiian uh, immersion. We have, um, we are developing a full Hawaiian medium experience. So um, from the time our families and our children come, unto, come to our school to the time they leave, we speak to them only in Hawaiian. Um, we have an area designated um, where we allow English to be spoken with families, but we try to keep our environment full of Hawaiian as much as possible. And that is true for our preschools, Punana Leo, as well as our K-12 site, um, um, Navahi, and also at um, Kahaka'ula. Once you, you take language class, um, one year of Hawaiian, um, Hawaiian language, they teach it through English. Then once you come in for your second year, they start to instruct you in the same method through the medium of Hawaiian. Um, up until you graduate. So any course you take 200 or higher is taught through Hawaiian. Mm. Yes. Great, great. And um, uh, Elisabetta, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about like some of the methodology that you use for, for teaching in the more of a community school type of setting? Yes. Um, the home and school um, connection is very important. So we incorporate a lot of teaching strategies where, um, you know, the parents are able to take those strategies and use it at home. Otherwise, um, teaching will only be within Lefetual, but we have to take it home. So um, we try to um, encourage our parents and we incorporate a lot of culturally um, relevant strategies such as you know coming together as a as a family where children where in the structure of our um, daily routines we all come together as a community like a phono we call it the phono uh, where everybody meets and that's where learning starts so um, it enhances the importance of of you know taking the knowledge and everything that you learn in school and use it and utilize it. So um, a lot of our hands-on um, activities, um, we try to break the walls of the classroom like I mentioned in my presentation because it's very important. Otherwise, the students will not be able to understand. So um, at, you know, this year, we're working really hard to um, bring um, I've put some of the strategies and um, even the activities um, make it available via technology and through our website and, and um, even our curriculum. Our curriculum materials, um, a draft of one semester will be given to all families as well as other people that are interested to, um, to learn. And we do welcome their suggestions and comments on how this material can be used and how we can improve it. So by the third year, which is 2016, we hope to include some of those suggestions and comments. Thank Very you. much. Um, and so we, I have uh, another question, and I think I'd maybe like to direct this one at Dorothy. 
Um, the question comes from Hartwell Francis. How can we set up a cultural exchange for our immersion students? The students at the Cherokee Language Immersion School could prepare some gifts for other schools. I mean, I know that Ms. Lazor has worked with many tribes um, on language um, projects. So do you have any ideas, Ms. Lazor, about setting up a cultural exchange for immersion students? Sorry, Ms. Lazor, I think your microphone might be um, on mute at the moment. Matt, I can um, you know, add um, an idea that we're hoping to incorporate in our program. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, the use of, of uh, a stuffed animal puppet, um, we're thinking of including that in all, in, in, in all our classes this year. We learned this strategy when we went to Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Auckland. Um, and that is where the children get to share. And I feel that um, if we have an exchange of some of these of animals or things that we that is dear to the children, they can exchange through um, that way, and they can, um, you know, express themselves through through these stuffed animals that is exchanged through culture or um, you know places. So. Cool. Yeah. Interesting uh, kinds of ways to share. And I can hear you now, Dorothy, if you'd like to um, okay. chime in. Okay, one of the things that we, we've tried here in our community is uh, we've done drama, we've done plays, and we have like a, an entertainment night, and we do it all in the language. And then we have radio talk shows, and um, we have um, different people from the different communities talking in their languages. And then we also have a dinner or a meal everybody likes to eat and have fun, so we have a, a meal. So, so those are some of the things that we've tried. Yeah, all great ideas. Um, and we all love food. <laughs> oh, okay, so the next question mm -hmm. I have comes from um, David White. And maybe I can direct this one at, um, at Kehau. Uh, what advice would you give to grassroots programs in promoting growth and, uh, growth and development? What were your greatest challenges in the beginning stages of your respective programs and how did you overcome them? Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to say is um, get a group of like-minded people who feel as passionately about um, language, you're, the language that you're trying to promote, um, you're trying to revitalize. Um, get the group together and um, stay focused on your um, your vision, because there will be a lot of reasons why you cannot succeed. But if you have a group where you all believe that you can, everyone, people will um, people will say things. There might be rules. There might be legislation. There, there will be attitudes that will say you cannot succeed, but it takes um, being focused on your goal. One of our biggest um, challenges when we first started was um, having people believe that we could revitalize our Hawaiian language and that Hawaiian language could come back and become the the a living language among our among people here in Hawaii. We still um, and every employee that comes in, any family that comes in uh, into our program and they leave, that is the very thing we instill in each and every one of ourselves and our families is we can. Our our ancestors did, our kupuna did, our elders did it, and we do it. 
not because we want to, but because it is our responsibility. And that's all I pretty much have to say. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, great, great points. It was about passion. And Dorothy, do you have um, anything else to add, like pointers to, you know, start up grassroot pro grassroots programs and um, how they can build a strong foundation and, and grow? Uh, I would say stay focused on um, being positive. You almost have to be like super positive. Because a lot of those, as she said, attitudes are, will come in. And um, you need to, we needed to stay away from people who did not want the language mm -hmm. and focus on getting a group of people who were of that same mindset. Mm -hmm. And we also focused on uh, students or adults who wanted to be speakers of the language. Mm -hmm. Like I have, through my teaching career, I noticed I had some students who would say to me, Miss Lazar, I want to be a speaker of Mohawk. I want to speak Mohawk. And like they went through the school system, they came out and they went to the immersion and today they are speakers. Mm -hmm. uh, one family, her and her husband became fluent speakers and they put their children in immersion and they became uh, speakers. The two little girls are speakers of the language and that's what we need to do. We need to focus on people who want it because mm -hmm. we need to bring our, we need to bring our languages back. We've lost a lot, but we need to bring it back. And I think if we stay focused on that idea that I want to be a speaker of my own native language and I will be a speaker of that's a strong commitment within that individual. And that's mm -hmm. what I'm noticing in the project that I'm presently doing. The students want to be speakers and some of them right now are taking what we are teaching them and passing it down to their children so they have a purpose. And I think that's what needs to happen. Yeah, thank you for those words of encouragement, um, Ms. Lazor. And I see that John Mayer um, from Le Fetua is typing. And so um, John says that, and this is, I think, going back to what um, Hartwell Francis was, was talking about. He, he says that cultural exchange over distance and linking different learning communities can be attempted through a program like Cultura um, from MIT. And he said that, that He's used it in Hawaii to link Samoan language students at a local high school, the university, and American Samoa. And he said that, you know, today's youth prefer and are more acclimated to internet-based activities. So he does provide a link to um, more about that culture program in the chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, Rosia Curry, who um, work as a staff member at ANA says that it would be nice and helpful to exchange pictures, books, and some cultural artifacts. Um, and so at this point, we have just about run out of time. Uh, if you have any more questions, you'll be able to direct them to the presenters, and I'll have their contact info on the screen after this. Um, I'll also be following this session with an email to everyone who registered, uh, and I'll, I'll include the PowerPoint we used today. Um, I'll include some links to relevant resources. I'll include the contact info for the presenters and um, a little more information that, that might be useful to you. Um, so I'd like to thank our presenters at this point for um, just being here to share your stories and to inspire all of us. And uh, really, we are honored to um, be able to have you here. Um, so thank you once again for being with us on this session today. Um. So just to recap, um, our goals for today's webinar were to highlight three champions of native language education and to allow them to tell their stories. And I think they've really done that. Um, and feel free to follow up with them afterwards. And our secondary goal is to alert you to ANA funding opportunities for native language programs. Um, I talked a little bit about that at the start of the webinar, and I'll have links to the uh, last year's funding opportunities in the follow-up email that I send um, after this webinar is done. And so a couple more resources that you might be interested in. Um, so 
if you haven't already joined it, you might want to find our native language Google community um, group. And so ANA hosts a Google Plus community that's specifically focused on native language education um, and issues regarding native language. And there's a hundred something people in that group now. And it's just a place where you can share um, news, relevant news stories about language or uh, research that you found, or maybe talk about models of education or anything. It's just you can nerd out on second, um, you know, on, on native language education there. So you can find and join us on Google+. Plus. Um, if you do have Gmail already, if you use Gmail, then you already have a Google Plus account. And so um, try and Google that. And I'll send out a link to that in the email after this. Um, you will, might also want to check our native language funding opportunity announcements. Um, the funding opportunity announcements for 2015 have not yet been released. But you can look at last year's FOAs on the funding opportunities page of the ANA website and get an idea of what the um, focus areas of our ANA language grants are. Um, and ANA language grants are um, you know, one to three years with an annual ceiling of $300,000. Um, so you can have a pretty good, um, good sized project to really get a real, some momentum off the ground um, through an ANA grant. And then we also have done a few other webinars on native language education in the past. Um, just like today's, they were also recorded and archived um, in the ANA Resource Library. So if you'd like to check those out, um, go to the ANA Resource Library and search for webinars or click on the webinar link. Uh, and you can just browse through past ones we've done. And one that I recommend is the Language Assessment and Proficiency Tools webinar, um, which focused on different um, culturally, culture-specific language assessment tools and um, how you can create one for your own uh, tribe or organization or culture. And I'll, I'll link to that in, in the post email as well. And so um, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, as you can see, I've listed all of the contact info for today's speakers. Um, uh, Elisa Petta requested that you um, contact her on her hawaii.edu email, which I will type into the chat box right now. And so I'll leave this info up on the screen um, and feel free to copy it down and contact the presenters um, on your own time with any follow-up questions you may have. And they've all given permission um, to share their information with you in, in order to hopefully support some of the language education um, momentum that you're making in your own communities. And so thank you once again for joining us. And um, I'm going to be ending the recording now, and you'll be able to find this recording in about one week in the ANA Resource Library. So thank you, everyone, and this concludes today's webinar. Aloha.